I usually went over to see Sophie once or twice a week after that, and what schooling we had, which was a matter of half a dozen children being taught to read and write and do some sums by a few old women, took place in the mornings. It was not difficult at the midday meal to slip away from the table early and to disappear until everyone would think someone else had found a job for me. And when her ankle was quite recovered, Sophie was able to show me the favorite corners of her territory. One day, I took her over to our side of the big bank to see the steam engine. There wasn't another steam engine within a hundred miles, and we were very proud of it. Corky, the man who looked after it, was not there. But the doors at the end of the shed were open, and letting out the sound of a rhythmic groaning, creaking and puffing. We ventured through the door and peered into the gloom inside. It was fascinating to watch the huge timbers move up and down with wheezing noises, while way up in the shadows of the roof, a huge beam rocked slowly backwards and forwards, with a pause at the end of each tilt, as though summoning its energy for the next effort. Fascinating, but after a time, monotonous. Ten minutes were enough, and so we withdrew to climb to the top of the huge woodpile beside the shed, and there we sat, with the whole heap quivering beneath us as the engine chugged on and on. My Uncle Axel says the old people must have had much better engines than this, I told her. My father says that if one quarter of the things they say about the old people were true, they must have been magicians and not even real people at all, Sophie answered. But they were wonderful, I insisted. Too wonderful to be true, he says, she told me. Well, doesn't he think they could fly, like people say? I asked. No, that's silly. If they could fly, we'd be able to. Well, there's lots of things that they could do that we're learning to do again, I argued. Not flying. She shook her head. Things can fly, or they can't. And we can't, she said. And I thought of telling her about my dream of the city, and the things flying over it. But after all, a dream isn't much evidence of anything, so I let it pass. And presently, we climbed down, leaving the engine to do its panting and creaking on its own, and we made our way to her home. John Wender, her father, was back from one of his many trips, and a sound of hammering came from the outside shed where he was stretching animal hides on wooden frames, and the whole place reeked of what he was doing. Sophie rushed to him and flung her arms around his neck, and he straightened up, holding her against him with one arm. Hello, chickie, he said. But he greeted me more gravely. We had an unspoken understanding that we were on a man-to-man -man basis. It had always been that way. And when he had first saw me, he had looked at me in a way that had scared me and made me afraid to speak in his presence. Gradually, however, that had changed. We became friends. He showed me and told me lots of interesting things. All the same, I would sometimes glance his way to find him staring at me uneasily. And no wonder... It was only years later that I could appreciate how badly troubled he must have been when he came home to find Sophie had sprained her ankle, and that it had been David Storm, the son of Joseph Storm, of all people, who had seen her foot. He must, I think, have been greatly tempted by the thought that a dead boy could break no promise. I don't know, perhaps Mrs. Wender had saved me. But I think he would have been reassured had he known of an incident at my home about a month after I met Sophie. I had run a splinter into my hand, and when I pulled it out, it bled. And so I went to the kitchen, only to find everybody too busy getting supper ready to be bothered with me. So I rummaged around in the rag drawer for a strip of cloth. I tried clumsily for a minute or two to tie it, and then my mother finally noticed, and she made noises of disapproval and, ins and insisted on my wound being washed. And then she wound the strip of cloth on neatly, grumbling that, of course, I had to go and hurt myself just when she was busy. And I said I was sorry, and I added, I guess I could have managed all right if I'd had another hand. And my voice must have carried through the room, for silence fell like a clap, and my mother froze. I looked around the room at the sudden silence, my sister Mary, standing with a pie in her hands, two of the farm workers waiting for their meal, my father about to take his seat at the head of our table, and the others. They were all staring at me, 
I caught my father's expression, just as it turned from amazement to anger. Alarmed, but not understanding, I watched his mouth tighten, his jaw push forward, his eyebrows pressed together. He demanded, What was that you said, boy? I knew the tone. I tried to think in a desperate hurry how I had offended him this time, and I stumbled and stuttered. I, I, I said I couldn't manage to tie it for myself, I told him. His eyes had become less incredulous and more accusing. And you wished for a third hand. No, no, father. I, I, I only said if I had another hand. Then you would be able to tie it. And if that was not a wish, what was it? I, I, I only meant if, I protested. I was alarmed and too confused to explain that I had only happened to use one way of expressing a difficult situation, which I could have put in a different way. I was aware that the rest of the people in the room had stopped staring at me, and were now looking nervously at my father. His expression was grim. You, my own son, calling upon the devil himself to give you another hand, he accused me. Uh, I wasn't, I only... Quiet, boy. Everyone in the room heard you. You'll certainly make it no better by lying about it. But were you or were you not expressing dissatisfaction with the form of the body that God gave you, the form in his own image? I, I, I just said if I... You blasphemed, boy. You found fault with the norm, and everybody here heard you. What have you to say about that? You know what the norm is? I gave up protesting. I knew well enough that my father, in his present mood, would not even try to understand me. And I muttered, like a parrot, the norm is the image of God. You do know, and yet knowing this, you deliberately wished yourself to be a mutant. This is a terrible thing, an outrageous thing. You, my son, committing blasphemy, and in front of his parents. And in his sternest voice, he added, What is a mutant? It's a thing accursed in the sight of God and man, I mumbled. And that is what you wish to be. What have you to say? And my heart sunk with certainty that it was useless to say anything. So I kept my lips shut and my eyes lowered. Down on your knees, he commanded. Kneel and pray. And the others all knelt as well. And my father's voice rose. Lord, we have sinned in omission. We beg thy forgiveness that we have not better instructed this child in thy laws. And the prayer seemed to go booming on for a long time. And after the amen, there was a pause until my father said, Now go to your room and pray. Pray, you wretched boy for forgiveness you do not even deserve, but which God in his mercy may grant you, I will come see you later. And later that night, when the pain which had followed my father's visit had somewhat abated, I lay awake, puzzling. I had no idea of wishing for a third hand, but even if I had, was it such a terrible thing just to think of having three hands? And what would happen if one actually had them, or anything else wrong, such as, for instance, an extra toe. And when I at last fell asleep, I had a dream. We were all gathered in the yard, just as we had been at the last purification ceremony. At that moment, it had been a little hairless calf that stood waiting, blinking stupidly at the knife in my father's hand. But in my dream, this time, it was a girl, Sophie, standing barefoot and trying to hide her whole long row of toes that everyone could see on each foot and we all stood staring at her, waiting. Presently, she began to run from one person to another, begging them to help her, but no one moved. No faces had any expression. My father started to walk towards her, the knife shining in his hand. Sophie grew frantic. She flittered from one unmoving person to another, tears running down her face. And my father, stern, immovable, kept on coming nearer, but still no one would move to help her. My father came closer still and stretched out his arms to prevent her from escaping. He caught her and dragged her to the middle of the yard, and the sun's edge began to show above the horizon, and everyone started to sing a hymn. My father held Sophie with one arm, just as he had held the struggling calf. He then raised his other hand high, and it swept down, and the knife flashed in the light of the rising sun, just as it had flashed when he had slit the calf's throat. I think if John and Mary Wender had been there when I woke up struggling and crying from my dream, and then lay in the dark trying to convince myself that the terrible images in my mind were nothing more than that, they would, I think, 
have felt quite a lot easier in their minds.